everyone, it's Britt, and today we're going to go over how I went about building a mod system. This is just how I do it. There are many different ways, but in the event that you are looking for ideas on how to build a magical system, this is just how I do it. So questions that you might find helpful to ask yourself. Who is the creator or creators of the magic? What limitations does it have? This is probably one of the more important questions. When was this system created? Where is the magic system located? Why do you need it in your story? And are there any exceptions to any of the magic rules within your world or the magic system itself? These, I'll star them, are probably the most important ones that you want to keep in mind because once you have the answers to those two questions, building becomes a little bit easier. Okay, so now that we have those questions in mind, let's break this section down. I'm hoping it will make sense to everybody, not just me. Okay, so for me, within Becton, which is a fictional town that I've created in Yorkshire, England, there was a coven. And I wrote it here, but let's break it down. So where is it? Our location is Becton, Yorkshire, England. It was established in the 1700s for people to escape persecution. The coven rules Becton, though they do allow other religious practices. As long as nobody actively tries to harm the coven, they leave you alone. This one right here, they, since they were escaping persecution, they don't see it fit to persecute other people, but there are rules within their own laws of magic. This is an easy rule to uphold, but it occasionally gets broken and the coven has to step. We'll get into that. Uh, they will accept anyone who's willing to convert. The coven is a lot of people who are troubled, runaways, of uh, I wrote foreign countries here, but it should say people from foreign countries uh, fleeing bad marriages or anyone seeking a sense of belonging. They can come to the coven and the coven will protect you. But different covens practice different sorts of magic, but I haven't developed these small subsets of covens as deeply as I have the main coven, the Blood Magic Coven. This right here, Blood Magic Coven. This is just a temporary name until I figure out something cooler. They are the main coven. They establish Becton and so they create the rules. But if a member of the coven dies of unnatural causes, they must, there must be a payment for the lives cut short. Or else there is consequences both within the coven and for the land in general. Bad things happen when witches die. If they do not summon the reaper, the reaper will find other ways of seeking another soul. The reaper is probably another stand-in title until I think of something cooler, but you get the idea. The coven has a unique ability that dreamers don't. I will go into what dreamers are in one second. They take, they can take the form of animals. Their favorite is a bird because it's easy to keep an eye on things when you're a bird. They can fly. They look inconspicuous. Uh, sometimes they, they have the ability to take control of whatever animal they want, but usually it's a bird. Uh, if someone becomes a ghost, they are stuck within the property line of where they died until their wrong has been put right or that they are ready to cross over. I'm gonna go back to this in a second. A ghost is almost always given the choice to cross over unless it is necessary for their soulmate to find them. If fate requires it, they must wait. If a ritual fails, it must be completed by someone else. So here I wrote an example is Kim's blood sacrifice. If you've read rumors from the attic, 
it's fine. It's just an example for me to refer to for when I give it, when I pass it along to my narrator, Gary. Dreamer rules. A dreamer must be an old soul. What is an old soul? There are two subsets of souls within this world. There's an old soul, and there are new souls, or baby souls, as I call them. Uh, an old soul has already lived a lifetime where a new soul has never lived a lifetime, so they have nothing to relive. So they can't, so a new soul cannot be a dreamer because they have not lived a past life. And in order to qualify as a dreamer, your soul has to have a life to relive. Does that make sense? If that doesn't make sense, I'll make a follow-up video and try to explain it. A dreamer must have a wrong to put right in this life. So basically what happened in the past, something went wrong and an old soul is essentially given a second chance within this modern day spectrum. So for this book's example, uh, we walk through both Victorian Becton with old soul Trevor and modern day Becton with present day Trevor, rebirthed Trevor. A dreams will always start the same. It will build itself according to a dreamer's personal connection. What that means is, I'm going to use Trevor as an example again since he's our protagonist. Trevor's dreams always start out in a place where it's just white and there's some, picture it like uh, a canvas, a blank canvas where it's white and then on all four corners there's some foggy misty stuff that blows in. Then as the foggy misty stuff blows in, since Trevor has a deep connection to tarot cards, old Victorian Becton builds itself in the tarot cards and then it's almost as if an invisible hand comes in and takes a paintbrush, sweeps across the canvas with some paint and then all of a sudden, boom, there's color and it's Becton as it was in the Victorian era. A dreamer will not have a memory they aren't ready to see. Dreaming is complicated when it comes to old souls because you are, your soul demands that you have these memories, but you also can't show a small child something very horrific. So the soul knows to a certain extent to wait until the dreamer reads reaches a certain level of maturity before it shows it certain things. So essentially you're growing up with both your present day life and your past life. It makes sense to me. I hope it makes sense to you. Dreams can repeat and dreams aren't always in sequence. It's up to the dreamer to piece things together. So another example just to make more sense of this whole section. Trevor, for example, uses a dream journal. So when he wakes up, he recounts the dream to the best of his ability, writes it down, and so he has a point of reference to flip back to when he's trying to piece these dreams together. If they haven't figured out names in the waking world, the dreamer will not know it. That part will be muted and blurred until the dreamer learns it. So most magic systems kind of need a bit of a, a handicap or it's too easy for, for the characters to figure out and it'll be a very short book. 
So how I went about that was you have to put research into these things for yourself. And by you, I mean characters, the characters. Trevor is always at the library, always looking at old newspaper articles, finding whatever he can that is a remnant of Victorian Beckton and learning from it. And the more that he learns, the more access, it, access to his memories he gains. That's how that works. So now we're going to break down a complicated bit about seeing happens when the dreamer is awake. It's usually triggered by a past life memory, and there are different levels of seeing why. Okay, level one, a dreamer will see a transparent layer over the modern equivalent. Uh, an example is North Troy Hill, which is the house uh, that Kim, Kevin, Trevor, Annie live in. Trevor sees the modern day equivalent clearly. He can differentiate the modern and the Victorian. The Victorian bits, as he lived it, it's almost like a ghost in, its up, in and of itself. So you know how in photo editing programs, you can have layers and as those, within those layers, you can turn the opacity up and down. Well, the modern day layer in this scenario. So let's take North Troy Hill. North Troy Hill is this Victorian house and it's been standing within Becton for at least 200 years. Trevor has lived in North Troy Hill, both in his present and past day life. But the difference between Victorian North Troy Hill and modern day North Troy Hill is subtle. He can see modern day North Troy Hill very clearly. It's full opacity, 100%. But then within his line of vision, it's this very light layer that's maybe set to 10 or 20 percent opacity that that is still victorian uh level two the dreamer's vision is completely consumed by the memory they will temporarily be blinded to anything modern day and instead will live the memory as if it is a dream sort of like daydreaming it's it's I don't know a better way to describe it other than daydreaming. This memory is so vivid and they get hit with it so suddenly that it completely blocks out their modern day vision. It's almost as if their old soul possesses them and they're like, you need to see it right now. This cannot wait. A blocking. Blocking level two out takes a fair bit of concentration. Uh, the dreamer needs to practice temporarily blocking out these things for times. A vision blocking or blinding them would be hazardous to their health, like driving. So it's kind of like an on and off switch. You can turn it on and off. Trevor is very good at turning his dreaming abilities on while another character, Branson, is very good at turning them off. So it's like different sides of the coin, but Trevor has a more in-depth understanding of dreaming than Branson. Each dreamer has a specific deck that is destined for them. This is talking about tarot decks, by the way. Uh, other decks will work, but the reading will be less clear. Without the deck that calls to them, they can't hear the cards speaking to them. But the dreamer must have a firm knowledge of tarot and has to work harder to get an accurate reading. They lacked that direct line to the, car to the deck that isn't the one. Uh, an example of this is the mermaid deck that Trevor comes across in Three Misfortunes when he he's in Dewhurst, Mississippi. If you don't know what that means, don't worry. Each dreamer has a card that is theirs. 
No matter what deck, a dreamer will always pull their card. So a dreamer cannot read for themselves, but they can have another dreamer or a non-dreamer conduct the reading for them as to not interfere. Um, an example of this is Trevor's card will always be judgment in the upright position, no matter what deck he picks up. Even if the card is pulled from the deck, judgment will always appear for him if he's doing the reading himself. It's part of soul magic and that whole dreamer magic. Dream catcher rules. Okay. Helen's rules. Helen is a dreamer and she is Trevor's younger sister, but her dreaming manifests a little bit differently from Trevor's, so I wanted to give her her own section. They, they don't differ all that much from a regular dreamer, so all dreamer rules apply to her. Trevor describes it in the book at one point as Helen is like a psychic medium, but she's not a fraud. He, he's throwing a little shade towards psychics because he feels that psychics are frauds and that they scam people out of money and he is very passionate about those subjects and making sure that people aren't getting ripped off. So him and psychics don't get on well, but that's the best way he can think of to describe Helen. She is the real deal. Where she has a connection to ghost, but she does not relive one life in its entirety. So a spirit or a ghost can come to Helen, inhabit her body, and she will experience the same sense of dreaming that Trevor does, but she will live multiple lives in order to help them. There's souls awaiting their fates, I, I guess you could say, and that they're kind of trapped in this in-between, this limbo, the soul limbo, waiting their turns. And dreamers like Helen can give them the ability to pass on without having to wait that long. One last section. Character traits that are important for me to keep in mind. Dreamers, Trevor, uh, he has a protection tattoo. It's a it's a Celtic uh, protection tattoo on his left shoulder. Uh, his tarot card is judgment in the upright position. We went over that. Helen is the six of pentacles in the reverse position. Branson is the lovers reversed. Non-dreamers is the for Kim. It's the tower. Kevin, it's the king of cups. In the they're, the twins both have cards in the upright position. And Annie, the youngest, is the ten of swords in the reverse position. Annie and Ransom are uh, connected in a very special way. There's lots of symbolism going on in here. I don't want to get too deeply into it, but if you are interested, I would recommend, if you're not familiar with tarot, look into these cards and maybe it will make a little bit more sense. But hopefully this is more than just a rambly, confusing mess and you find it helpful. Anyway guys, I love you and I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.